Hello there guys and welcome to another video on my channel. You're joining me on a four day trip aboard the brand new BMW i5 Touring and it's not just any Touring model. This is the M60 version, the top of the range if you will when it comes to the i5. Um, you could call it the equivalent of an M5 but in electric shape and um, it's gonna be a rather short video because I already showed you everything you need to know about the i5 in sedan shape today we're focused on the differences between that car and this one and we're gonna focus on the numbers I got with this car in terms of energy consumption and of course range this is the touring version so basically we have a different shape at the back and I'm guessing no I'm not guessing I'm sure that for me personally this is the first time when the design of the touring version of the bmw 5 series feels more attractive to me rather than the sedan usually i prefer sedans i'm i i, I wasn't a big fan of touring models until recently but some sometimes la last year i started to change my optics in this regard because i drove the rs6 from audi and um, I'm, I started to like sedans, uh, to, to like wagons and estates and call them however you want to. Uh, because that RS6 was quite something. And since, if you probably watched my 5 series or i5 videos over here on my channel, you probably noticed that I don't really like the shape of the new 5 series. I understand why it looks like this. It's a massive car with a tall greenhouse and it looks rather big. I understand why it had to be shaped out like that because BMW decided to create both the ICE version and the electric version on the same platform so you need room in the floor to accommodate the battery pack so you had to make it a bit taller it's the same thing with the 7 series so that's why both of them look so massive so big um, but even though I understand why it's done like that that doesn't necessarily transform me automatically into a fan um, so yeah, well, uh, the, the thing I don't like is the way the whole, if you look at the car from the side, you see how abrupt the uh, hood is, for example, it has a huge angle towards the, uh, the windscreen and then on the back, you see how short the slope is so and how the, the boot is a bit taller than usual. On the Touring, you don't see that in the back because you have a round shape right you have a tailgate so you don't really see that in the back end i think it looks rather nice and somehow i can get used to the, the new front end it's not terrible it's not great but it's okay and in this configuration it, it does actually work really nice because we have a deep frozen gray on this car which basically looks like a black color to be honest a shade of black uh, but everything has been blacked out on the front end of this car uh, because of the M Sport Pro package and it does look really nice. I like the grill, the blocked out grill with the M badge and everything. Uh, I even like the fact that it's highlighted if you want to. It's illuminated on the outside. So yeah, it feels pretty nice and it looks pretty nice. As for the boot, well, you because BMW adopted this technical solution to, to make both cars uh, both electric and internal combustion cars on the same platform you don't have to sacrifice any storage in the boot you have the same 570 liters as you do on the touring uh, ICE model and if you fold the seats you don't get a flat surface but you get up to 1700 liters of space in the back so it's still a practical car but there are some caveats uh, as you probably already know the 5 series touring has lost some of it some of its main features uh, for example it did lose the capacity of opening solely the glass portion of the tailgate to access the boot which does sadden me also the the tonneau cover in the back doesn't really slide back automatically whenever you open it that's something that was lost too and if we're talking about the 5 series with the ICE engine uh, you don't get things like uh, adaptive uh, or passive air suspension anymore it's something that the touring had for the past three or four generations i don't really remember since the e39 all 
5 Series Touring models had air suspension on the rear axle. That's gone. You can't even get it as an optional feature. Um, so yeah, this is the electric version though. And the electric cars do get air suspension as standard, both front and back. That's because they are considerably heavier than the ICE version. For example, this one is about 450 kilos heavier than the 520D I drove earlier this year. So yeah, there is a hefty weight difference. This is the M Performance model. So you do get a couple of extra bits. For example, you get the M Sport package as standard. Um, and that means a lower ride height and stiffer bushings and everything in between to make it a bit sportier. But this one also has the M Professional Adaptive uh, suspension, which means you get a further lowered uh, suspension by eight extra millimeters. So in, to in total, you get 12 extra millimeters or less millimeters in ground clearance on this car to make it feel a bit sportier overall and control the weight even better. Uh, you also get M style uh, side mirrors. On th in this case, we have them done in carbon uh, fiber because it's an op uh, additional extra um, worth about 1200 euros. Um, and we have 20 inch alloys on this car. We have the red brake calipers part of the M Sport Pro package. We have the glass roof. Another thing I don't like about the 5 Series Touring right now is the fact that you cannot get an opening sunroof. This is the only thing you can get. That's something that's going to be sorely missed. Um, but overall, inside, it looks exactly the same. No matter what kind of drivetrain you have, everything looks the same. We have this huge curved screen. We have the latest infotainment system and so on. We have the M Sport steering wheel, which looks absolutely brilliant in my book. And I love this red ring over here that shows you exactly where the steering wheel is. And we have a lot of driver's assistance systems. Right now, I have the adaptive um, cruise control system turned on and it works flawlessly so that I can concentrate and talk to you guys. So the car basically drives itself. I only have to look forward because there's a camera in the dashboard that watches my face to make sure I'm paying attention to the road. And of course, I have to keep my hands on the steering wheel. But right now, the car is slowing down because the car in front of me is slowing down and so on. Uh, uh, talking of that, let's talk about the technical side of things. So this is the electric version. Basically, you have an 81.2 kilowatt hour usable battery in the in the floor. Um, and in this case, because we're talking about the M60 model, we have 600 horsepower at our disposal and 840 Newton meters of torque. Thanks to two electric motors, one on the front axle, one on the rear axle. Um, the front axle one has 260 horsepower. The rear axle one has 340. And uh, that means you can do 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in uh, 3.9 seconds, despite the fact that this car weighs 2.3 tons, closer to 2.4. So it's a really fast machine. But it also drives really well. We have integral steering as well. So basically the rear axle turns in tandem with the front wheels or in the other direction, depending on the speed you're doing and uh, it feels lighter than you would expect, especially in sport mode, where the suspension stiffens up, it feels a lot lighter than you would expect. Also in the corners, that rear wheel steering does help out a lot and the car feels shorter than it actually is at over five meters long. So overall, I think they did a great job at making this car feel sporty enough. The only thing I don't understand is who would buy this car with this spec because since you have 600 horsepower under the hood i mean where are you ever going to use them and you can't really expect this car not to be thirsty as we would say on internal combustion cars you have to expect it to have a rather high electric consumption because you do have a lot of power so i know some people will invoke other cars right now but you can't really expect incredible mileage out of this car let's talk about energy consumption shall we so around town depending on the town you're in because i drove this car in two different towns uh, actually big cities not towns i didn't see quite a huge change in energy consumption so in a smaller city i saw an average of about 25 kilowatt hours per hundred kilometers covered which would translate to about 
320 kilometers of range, 200 miles. On a busier, in a busier city, one of the busiest in Europe, in Bucharest, I saw an average of 27 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers cover. So not a huge difference. Basically, dropping the the range to about 300 kilometers or 186 miles. So, it, I. I don't think you're gonna get much more than that, and it was summertime, so I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking during winter time things will get worse. As we all know, cold and batteries don't really work together. Now, on a series of B roads, that energy consumption dropped to 20 kilowatt hours, which would give you a 400 kilometer range, which is okay. And then on the highway, that figure go, has gone up to. 25 kilowatt hours and I'm going to reset the trip computer right now because I'm on the highway to see how it does at 130 kilometers an hour and I know in some places around the world the speed limit on the highway is closer to 120 kilometers an hour so that's what I got and I really did drive this car a lot these days and I really had to recharge it a number of times I had to recharge it three times uh, and I was always pleasantly surprised because even though the spec sheet does say this car has a maximum charging power of uh, 205 206 kilowatts um, that's not the most important thing about this car the most important thing is the charging curve uh, and it's quite impressive because even over 80 percent where usually electric cars um, limit their charging power to uh, protect the batteries this car was still doing 60 50 60 kilowatts uh, in terms of power, so it, I was quite impressed by it, not just because of that, but because every time I hooked it up to a charger and I went to 100%, normally when you're, a, when, you're a, when you're on a longer trip, you should charge it to about 80% because it, the whole process takes less time, uh, but I did charge it to 100% and twice, and each time the estimate of the car was more conservative than the actual result what i mean by that is every time i got i started at around 40 or 50 percent uh every time i the estimate of the car was at once in one case when i started to charge it from 40 percent to 100 percent the estimate was one hour and 15 minutes and they actually act, the car actually finished 20 minutes faster uh and the same happened the second time when I had to charge it from 55% to 100%, um, the charging time estimate by the car was about an hour, and it only took like 45 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes, something around that. So yeah, it surprised me every time because it charged faster than I expected. Is this the fastest charging car on the market? No, but I think it's usable enough for longer trips depending on your goal. Um, BMW says that if you can find a charger that can take, can deliver 200 kilowatts, you should be able to charge this car from 10% to 80% in about 26 minutes. And I do believe them. Based on my experience with this car, I think they are accurate in their estimate. Um, so yeah, that, those are the numbers I got. If you wanna compare them to the sedan, I have a video about that car on my channel i'm gonna drop a link over here on the screen um, so you can compare the two but overall i did enjoy my time with this car it's incredibly comfortable incredibly refined very well sound insulated i'm on the highway right now and there's not a lot of wind noise driving it around town is incredibly easy i love the adaptive regenerative braking system which basically means whenever you take your foot off the go faster pedal uh, the car recuperates energy at a faster or slower rate depending on the traffic situation around you depending on how close you are from you are to the car in front of you and so on so it works flawlessly i tried driving this car in b mode which is braking mode using the maximum recuperation system possible but i saw worse results in that mode so i guess coasting at times will help out in terms of energy consumption um, but i Personally, I think 600 horsepower on a car this size is too much. You don't really need it. I would personally go for the eDrive 40 version with 340 horsepower because you have the exact same battery on the rear, uh, under the floor, and um, 
you only have one electric motor on the rear axle, 340 horsepower, which should be enough for any of your needs, to be honest. So uh, you would probably get a, a, a better range out of it. Actually, I saw a video on car wow testing that exact car, but in sedan guys, not as a touring, and they got close to 300 miles of range out of it on the highway which basically is 100 extra miles compared to what I'm getting right now, but the speed was lower as well. So yes, that would be my choice. It would probably be a cheaper car as well. So I'm curious about your picks because if we're talking about rivals here, usually at the end of my videos, I'm talking about rivals. There aren't a lot of them out there because everybody's focused on SUVs right now. And if we're talking about touring models or estates, wagons, whatever you want to call them, you don't really get that many of them. I would say right now, I can't even think of one car with this body type that's also electric right now. So if you do know something along those lines and I'm missing something right now, please let me know in the comment section below. Until next time, of course, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Don't forget to feed your passions, of course. And um, don't forget to watch my videos in order to support my channel. Ciao.